Uh, there's probably a little thing on your screen that's popped up recorded. about being recorded. So you might need to click an OK there. Um, we record these so people who want to go back and watch or people who missed it can have that opportunity. Um, in the chat, will you just put uh, where you teach, like the stake that you teach in and the number of years? If this is your first year, just put first. Um, it's kind of fun for each other to see who's on the Zoom call and the experience that's here or, or newness. If you're feeling, feeling like you're the only one who's a first year teacher. Um, I'm gonna great. Third year, three and a half. Yeah, this is my. Is Sumter a stake? Did you put our stake? Forgot to. No, it's in um, Columbia Stake. Okay. Okay. With Brother McGuire there. Okay. Great. I'm just making sure that wasn't in one of my South Carolina <laughs> stakes that I wasn't remembering. <laughs> Good. All right, thank you. That's fun to see. Um, and there'll be some chances for you to, to share some thoughts with us uh, as we go through this. Let me get this PowerPoint up here. So today's topic uh, is our ability as teachers to recognize and believe in each learner's divine identity and purpose. Uh, we wanna talk about just first off, why it's important to recognize and believe in their divine identity and purpose. And then I want to give you some practical ideas of what it means when a teacher actually uh, believes this, like what their classroom looks like, yeah, because they believe in the divine identity um, of their students. So let's start with a little just study here together. Will you choose two of these blocks um, and just look at the scriptures and see if you can make some connections between what the verses are teaching and recognizing and believe in each, each learner's divine identity and purpose. Let's just take like three minutes as we search two of these scriptures and try to make some connections between our topic today and what these verses say. I'll be right, we'll be back together in two minutes. Do an Ashton. I gotta get a phone.
<clears throat> Love to have a few of you share what you see. I can share. Um, I, I took um, Abraham three and then first Samuel. I actually first went to first Samuel and I love this scripture um, because it immediately reminded me of Elder Holland in general conference, how he said that, um, and I'm probably paraphrasing it, but how we said that we are God's um, most precious possession. And that to me wraps everything up that I am his most prized and precious possession. And if I can look at my students with those same eyes, oh my gosh, I just, it makes me excited. Thanks, Jenny. That's a great thought. And uh, I, I, go ahead. Oh, I did 1 Corinthians 12, 21 through 23. And it was where every member is needed a body and and so every student is needed in seminary, even though some may act like they don't want to be there, they're still needed and they contribute to the, to the whole. Thank you, Roxy. That's so, so important. So, I, so I noticed important. in uh, Doctrine and Covenants and in the Abraham where he talked about the, the uh, spirits being noble and great, and they were the ones to come forward now. Love that. Thanks, Roy. Joy and then Dane. Joy, go ahead. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, I really like 1 Samuel 16, 7. Look not on his countenance, um, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth, but... Um, the Lord looketh on the heart. And I think that really applies to the way we interact with our students. And we have to realize that outward appearances are not all what, uh, you know, what they seem to be. And we need to try to see our students as the Lord sees them. And as a mom, I, you know, I kind of know the potential. I feel like I have an, an idea what the potential of my own personal children are. I probably see that more than other people do. And I think we need to try to develop that ability with our seminary and institute students as well. Thank you. I, I don't know that there's much more important things that you could do as a teacher than what you just described right there, Joy. As you talk about being a parent of your own children, recognizing that every single kid that comes to our class has parents, right, who have great hopes for their kids and sees the potential in them and is praying for you as a seminary teacher that you'll be able to see that same thing and being able to help them see it in themselves. Dane, what was your thought? Well, uh, Roy kind of stole my thunder there. Um, <laughs> I, I read uh, Dr. Covenants and Abraham. But so what, I'm, what I'll do, I'll just add a little more to that. Right. Um, because it was very... This, that, that was very personal to me personally that, um, about choice spirits being held back and come forth to this day. Uh, when I uh, when I first joined the church, uh, you know, the, this was back in 75, 70, and before the priesthood issue, and uh, people were saying, well, Dana, you were, uh, you're, you were, I guess you did something in the pre-existence that you were kind of cursed and so forth and but yet my patriarchal blessing said that i was held back i was chosen and held back to come in this day so i had that uh c conflict there and so I, I now i've realized that you know the thing about this curse was just a a a, a fable or whatever in yeah. um I, I was grateful to hold on to that to know that I was chosen before this earth to come at this time. And, and that's what these two scriptures reminded me of. Thank you, Dane. I really appreciate you sharing that with us. I could feel the truth of it as you were speaking. And I even had the feeling, Dane, that 
you were reserved and prepared for this very moment to be in this upcoming school year to be the seminary teacher of the students who will be in your class. Um, so awesome. I love what you said. Chris. Chris, I'm not sure why, but we can't hear you. You're unmuted. Maybe you just need to get a little closer. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I agreed with the sister who previously spoke about First Corinthians, but I also caught this little part. And the members which we think to be less honorable. For me, hmm. that's uh, the troublemakers. And instead of alienating them and figuring, you know, I'll just ignore them or they'll go away or whatever, um, they put more honor on them. And um, I truly believe Satan works on the most valiant. And for ever, whatever reason, fear, resentment, anger, whatever, um, we, we say who we are through our actions and, and I mean, um, what we're feeling inside from our actions. And so I know that as a seminary teacher, this is my first year. So I know as a seminary teacher, I'm going to have to be um, really in tune with the spirit and be Christ-like to every single kid in that class. And when you have prejudgments of troublemakers, um, what you know is what did Christ do when when people were um, chastising him? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And uh, that's what I got out of that. That's beautiful. Thank you. These, these might be scriptures worth taking a picture of or, or writing down. So in those times when it's easy to forget these truths, you can go back to them and and remember who's in your class. Uh, remember who they really are. I, I want to do a, just a quick exercise. I'm going to talk through this. This isn't prepared on my PowerPoint or anything, but it, it's just come to mind as you guys have shared your beautiful insights. Um, and maybe this could be useful. I, I like to do this with students um, early in a semester, or if I'm doing like a fireside, this is the type of thing that I would do with them where I would say, uh, I want, I'm going to ask you three questions. Um, and I just want you to write down the first things that come to your mind. And the first question is, how do uh, other people perceive you? How do other people view you? What, what do you think people would say um, about who you are? Just write down three, four, five words that would describe how you think other people view you. The second one, after some time, after they give them a chance to write that down, I would say, Okay, how about how you view yourself? You just write down three, four, five words about how you view yourself. You know yourself well. How do you, how do you see yourself? And then number three is, um, from what you know about the scriptures and the words of the prophets, how does God view you? How does God perceive you? And let them write down that a little bit. And then I'd say something like, um, tell me your observations from that experience. Like as you wrote down those things and had those different questions, what, what did you learn? Um, and then I say, which one of those is true about who you are? Seminary soon. And of course they know that it's how God views them. It, it, there is more truth in how God views them than even how they view their own selves, right? Or how others view them for sure. And then I like to go to Jacob chapter four, verse 13, and identify a word that is in Jacob four. And I'm sorry, I, this just came to my mind, so I'm not prepared to show you stuff. But Jacob four, verse 13 has the word really in it. R-E-A-L-L-Y, really. And it's actually the only time in all of scripture the word really is exists. It's fascinating to me that of all the scripture we have, the word really exists only in this verse. And it's talking about truth. Things as they really are and things as they really will be is what it says in Jacob chapter four. 
So what we need our students and what we as teachers need to do is know who they really are, right? Things as they really are, the truth. And it's so easy to forget or misunderstand who we really are. And it's our opportunity as teachers to recognize who our students really are. And these, these truths explain that. Any thoughts, questions, comments before we continue on? I, I just have one and I did it last year with um, the kids in my class. Um, whenever we ran across a scripture that talked about who you really were, we have this poster on the wall and it says, I am. And then mm. anything that had to do with that, we started making a list through the year. And then when conference came, you know, we took that in or something was in a devotion. And so it was a list for them too, because I want them to see who they are um, and their potential. And it, it made me feel very good because after the list got about halfway done i noticed one of my students taking a picture of their cell with their cell phone of that list and i and that made me feel like it was totally worth the whole thing because apparently that student was thinking more about it and deeper about it it's a really good idea roxy thanks for sharing it with us yeah the truth is they're being fed messages all the time about who they are right from the world from their friends, from the way they compare themselves utilizing social media. And uh, we have to help them utilizing the scriptures to see who they, who they really are. That'll be a, a huge blessing to them. Um, thank you. I wanted to emphasize this skill, <laughs> which we are calling it a skill today, of recognizing, which is kind of what we've been doing right now, and also believing. It's one thing to recognize who our students are and who we are. It's another thing to believe it. And belief is often indicated in our actions, right? So if I believe, if I recognize this in my students, my belief is manifested in the things that I do with them in class. Okay? And so let, let's just keep that in mind here that it's one thing to recognize it but it's another thing to actually act upon that belief by the things that we do as teachers in class. Here's a couple of paragraphs out of the Gospel Teaching and Learning Handbook. If you're new this year, uh, you may not know that there is a brand new Gospel Teaching and Learning Handbook that is for all gospel teaching in the church that was designed by the seminary part of the church and now is being utilized by all areas of teaching. But this is all brand new, really, really well done, very concise, like small uh, and to the point stuff. So let's read this. Um, Lindsay Watkins, would you mind reading this slide? Sure. Thanks. When teachers love as the savior loves, they see others as he sees them. Christ-like love inspires a teacher to never give up in helping each young man and woman to become truly converted. As you strive to see those you teach as God sees them, you will recognize their divine worth, and the Spirit will teach you what to do to help them achieve their potential. Anything stand out to anybody in this slide? Yeah, if you remind me, I that that's the key is that you know we are the the key focus of us as teachers is to have the students come to know the Savior. You know that this is just not a class to, to learn about the Savior. Mm. It's a it's a class that will introduce them to, and and if they if they don't already have it, introduce them to get to personally know the Savior and have the Savior in their lives. Absolutely. Beautiful, Dane. Thank you. Joy. You're on mute still, Joy. Uh, 
Okay, I apologize. Um, I just really like the line, the, the very last line. You will recognize, um, as you strive to see those you teach as God sees them. Um, basically, the part I like was the spirit will teach you what to do to help them achieve their potential. And I think that to me, that's one of the biggest challenges is to learn how to listen to the spirit <laughs> teach me about my students. Yeah, you want to know what you could start doing right now to prepare to teach this fall. I'm sure there's all sorts of things you could read and study, but I would suggest you seeking the spirit to come to see your students for who they really are may be the most important thing you could do this summer is to start to pray for that gift uh, to see them for who they really are and have the spirit teach you about it, help, how to help them. Uh, Chris. Uh, well, that was essentially what I was going to say about um, the spirit is what spoke to me on this one is um, it's not me um, teaching them a, a Christ like love. It's the spirit um, being invited in through me to them, but they also need to invite the spirit also. It's a covenant. We make yep. with the classroom, not just one. And the other thing that strikes me there, Chris, is when a student doesn't do that, when a student's not really trying, this type of teacher doesn't give up on them, right? Doesn't exactly. continues to try to find ways to, to reach them and help them see um, who they are. Because you're going to have students who are not acting like their divine potential right? Who are not acting in faith, who are not striving to learn. And it would be tempting to, well, I'll just teach the kids who care. You know, I'll just, I'll just focus on those who, who want to learn. Um, well, and I believe that Heavenly Father really prepared me for this. I, I don't want to think it as revenge, <laughs> but my youngest was one of those <laughs> that uh, uh, the teacher really gave up on him and uh and i i saw his potential but the teacher didn't so this is my chance to rectify um uh how my son was was treated i i'm really more i'm actually more in tune with those who are um who are vulnerable yeah thanks chris appreciate you sharing that with us dane Yes, um, this did bring up a, a question I have because um, <clears throat> uh, last semester we, we had a student that um, you can tell they had some kind of mental uh, impediments. Uh, um, and you tell they weren't quite grasping. I mean, how far do you go when you feel that a person just not able to get it or something, you know, you know, where, where we go in that gray area of, of someone who has like mental capacities, you know, autistic and or something like that. Um, yeah, it's a good, <laughs> it's a good question, Dane. Um, you know, it's, what we'd want to do in a situation like that is, is have conversations with parents and bishops and people from the stake of what would most bless this individual. And if that's in a large group setting where they are able to glean things here or there, but not really understand everything, then let's do that. If it's in a smaller setting of, of a smaller class where they can get some more personal attention, then let's do that. If it's in a setting where actually mom and dad are teaching the kid one-on-one, -on -one, then let's do that, right? What would most bless this particular individual is the conversation that needs to happen. Thank you. Yeah. Could I uh, address that just for Please. a second? Um, in uh, my classes, I have had students who've had uh, learning disabilities or attention deficit disorder, um, and also some uh, mental or intellectual challenges. Um, I have a niece who uh, was adopted from Russia at three and she can read, but her retention is very, very poor. Um, 
she really will grasp a, a concept one day and the next day it's just not there. Um, a lot of it has to do with her emotional and some nutritional and some uh, other things that have gone on in her life. But uh, we found that she benefited from the social and the spiritual strength that she gained from interacting with the other students. Um, but when it came time to uh, read every day, I would text her a scripture every day that she would read. And uh, if she was presenting the devotional, the next day she would share the one she'd read and told how she felt about it. And when it came time for the um, assessment, I would read her the questions and the possible answers. And she would uh, tell me which one she thought it was and why. And when it came to the written question, she was able to formulate a response that was acceptable. But there are accommodations you can make, but still help them to be able to benefit from them being able to feel the spirit that the other students bring to the class and help them to accept each other in that way and see each other for who they really are and their divine potential. Thank you, Nancy. I appreciate that. That is great. Thank you. Let's look at this next part from the uh, um, from the handbook. Um, Sister Rollins. Am I saying that right? Would you read this slide? It is essential that gospel teachers focus on each learner's divine identity and potential, see them as contributors, and empower them to learn for themselves by faith. If the youth sense that you trust them, their confidence and their divine potential will grow, and they will surprise you with what they can accomplish. All right, thank you. Things that stand out here in this paragraph. You can just speak up. I, I'm not sure if hands are up from last okay. question or this one. I will just speak up. This is Joy Coles. Um, I like the line, you know, that the, if the youth sense that you trust them, their confidence in their, their potential will grow. And I think we have to be trusting in them enough to give them more responsibilities, like you know, assigning that devotional, seeing if any, you know, will serve as maybe a class president or um, study and present a part of the lesson, giving them more responsibilities. And that's hard for us as teachers, I think, to let go and give that to them, hoping they'll come through, hoping they'll they'll do what you asked because they don't always as teenagers. But I think it is something that I need to probably is trusting them more and, and conveying that trust and giving them responsibilities in the learning process. Thanks, Joy. I hope that you will do that. It will matter and they will sense it. Teenagers are super good at sensing motive, um, how you feel, you know, and so they will know whether or not you actually trust them and uh, they'll step up to it when you do. Anything else stand out? Any thoughts about the word contributors in this paragraph? I have a thought on that. Um, Please. In our... In our group last year, we had some children who would always give these most crazy answers to questions that were out there. They were so far outside the ballpark. And our my main point was, how do I reel them back in? And sometimes it would be something about maybe a cartoon or some commercial they saw, but there was always a way to tie that cartoon or that commercial back into the subject. And it was impressive to me how the spirit would always help me reel them back in through that. So it, it kind of made them think, even if I'm thinking this crazy idea, somehow there is something in that idea that is tied to what we're talking about, tied to something spiritual, tied to um, what Heavenly Father wants us to understand and learn. So it made them also think, okay, so Sister K is actually hearing me and what mm -hmm. I'm saying. And it it really matters to her that she will bring it back to what God wants me to know. Thank you. 
That's, that is awesome. Elder Bednar said, teaching is not talking and telling. Teaching is listening, observing, and discerning. That's, that's a, a different approach, right? When I am listening to my students, I'm observing them, and I'm discerning what needs to, to happen next. And just so focused on talking and telling. Awesome. We're going to keep moving on here. I'll read this slide. Also from the handbook, teachers with a sense of purpose who truly love their students will care too much about their progress and success to be satisfied with only a little effort from the students. Such teachers will encourage with love and will lift their students to reach their potential as learners and disciples of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is a big paragraph, right? That I love my students so much that I have high expectations for them, right? This is the, uh, I don't know if you've ever studied Elder Anderson's background, but he talks a lot about high love, high expectations as like the perfect combination of, of working with people, whether that's in business or in church things or in a seminary class. When I have high love, I also have high expectations for those I associate with. Um, they actually reflect one another. High love and high expectations go hand in hand. And uh, this can happen in seminary where the amount of love we have for them, recognizing their divine potential, who they really are, um, then mean that we have a lot for them to do, a lot for them to be involved with in class. It's tempting to feel like, oh, our, our youth are overburdened. Our youth already have a lot going on. We're just so glad that they're present in my class. They just showed up. And while we are very, very grateful that they're there, we know that learning requires effort, right? Learning requires them to act in faith. And so as a teacher who loves and sees their divine potential, we, we encourage and motivate uh, them to use their full potential in the learning setting. So uh, I want to introduce um, some ideas about how to do these things. What does this look like in practical terms when I recognize and believe in the divine potential of my students? Um, you may have heard of um, some of these principles before, but I'm just going to kind of talk at you a little bit here for a minute, and then I'll have you ask questions. So um, a couple of more things here I'll emphasize. Students are edified when they are led through a process, a learning process that's similar to what the teacher has experienced during lesson prep. Students should be led to search the scriptures for understanding and to discover the truths of the gospel for themselves. They, the students, should be given opportunities to explain the gospel in their own words and to share and testify of what they know and feel. A lot of learning in the church happens where a teacher has a great experience prepping, and then the teacher comes and shares all the wonderful things that they learned preparing. What we're trying to do in seminary is not that. <laughs> we're trying to help students have a similar experience that you had as you were studying the scriptures so that they can be just as excited as you are from the things that you discovered when they discover things for themselves, right? Continuing on here, um, our role, this is from our administrator, our role as teachers is to help students discover, understand, and live the truths they have acquired for themselves, it is not simply to dispense the knowledge we have acquired. Great teachers don't teach. That's a fascinating phrase. They help students learn. We should expand what we think of as effective teaching and focus more not on telling, but on helping our students have experiences that invite learning. So um, some of you have probably been introduced to this idea of what is being termed scripture feasting, um, but it's an idea of allowing students to dive into scripture blocks themselves at the beginning of class 
uh, with a question in mind and searching and, and preparing to share what they have found. Here's, here are eight questions that are often used in this scripture feasting experience um, where a, a block is given to a student. Let's say, you know, Isaiah chapter one, verses one through 10. And they're invited to choose one of these questions to uh, read the block through these eyes and then see what they find and then share it with their classmates. Um, here's a little bookmark that, that is used sometimes. And I could, uh, I have some PDFs of this that can be printed out if you would like a copy. But this is a little bookmark that goes with the students. And as they study, they have this, um, these questions that were just shown to you. On the flip side of this bookmark has some scripture study skills, um, some skills that can be used to help help them as they as they study. Um, I, I'm going fast on purpose. I'll give you a chance to ask questions here in just a minute. But a basic structure of a class that utilizes this idea of scripture feasting is that a teacher at the beginning of class, after a devotional, after a prayer, and potentially a song, uh, the teacher introduces the content for the day. They provide the context, remind the students what happened yesterday, <coughs> also reminding the students why we're studying the scriptures, potentially with a quote from a prophet or just an experience about the power of the word. And then they allow the students to jump into the scripture block themselves in, in complete silence in class where they, you know, have 10 ish verses and this question in mind, and they just study on their own. Of course, the teacher gives context and background and helping them prep for that study, but lets them read on their own. And then for eight-ish to 12 minutes, they let the students share what they found. While the teacher does what we just talked about, the teacher is listening, they're observing, potentially while they discern, they're feeling like they should ask a follow-up question or dig a little deeper with a student or pull a little bit more out of them, right? They're, they're listening to what's going on in the classroom and trying to facilitate an experience where the students are discovering for themselves. And then with whatever time is left, you know, some days it would be 30 minutes or left. Some days there may be five minutes left, just depending on the dialogue and how things go. A teacher has prepared some, some principles they want to identify uh, maybe a, an additional quote or uh, an object lesson or some sort of what we might call traditional learning things um, for the rest of the, the classroom period. This takes a lot of trust in students, right? This takes some training by teachers to be patient and, and help their students discover. But to me, it really goes hand in hand with us recognizing and believing in who they really are and their abilities to, to discover spiritual truth. So uh, that was fast and quick, but uh, I'd love to take any questions or insights or thoughts. Dane, you have your hand up. Oh yeah. When you were talking about this, I was immediately thinking about one of the biggest obstacles I have, not just in seminary, but even in my own home, is the fact that social media has trained our children that answers come immediately by just asking a question. You know, they did go to Google and they get their yeah. answer. And um, many times I've um, tried to, they, add, they would ask me a gospel question and, and I'm tempted to just answer it. But I say, no, no. I, I want you to find out for yourself. And they look at me with this look in their face like, what? <laughs> I mean, do I have to actually do some work? And in, 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 in the class, in, in, I noticed a little of that, I see that was in some of the students is uh, they're wanting a quick answer. And, and um, maybe I'm asking for some, uh, some more experienced hands out there. How do you overcome that 
social media, um, 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 uh, what's the training from the social media to to take your time and and do a personal search and and do things. If you have a question, look it up yourself. Dane, my response would be to do that and model that in class, right? A question right. comes up and you talk through it. If, if you were home alone right. right now and you had this question, what would you do? And let's do that right now. Let, let's search for this answer together right now. And you, you might have to give them some hints. You might say, let's, let's go to the topical guide, right? Let's go to... Um, True to the faith, let's go to this resource and see what we can find together. And you you model that experience with them. Brother Webb, we called it um, going on a treasure hunt. Yeah. It was kind of like our seminary answer to Google. Hmm. And so instead of using, they, they always say, I'm going to, I'll Google that. And Instead, we'd say, well, let's go on a treasure hunt using, and we would only use the resources that we had in our gospel library. They Love could it. use anything, magazines, anything they could. And also, um, I find it's very help. It was very helpful. The, the bookmark is, is great. Um, changed my whole way of thinking about teaching. Um, but even if you don't go into that, I found it very helpful when you ask them to, to read scriptures to even just tell them to, to search for a word or, um, you know, anything doesn't have to be those questions, but just to give them something yeah. to look for yep. in the scriptures um, takes them from just reading it to really thinking about it and takes them that one more step into studying. Excellent. Really well said. Thank you. Roxy, you have your hand up. Um, yes, I uh, entered to this teaching scriptures last year, and I tried to implement it into my teaching. And I guess I have a question yep. of how to use this. I have uh, two students in my class that have eye, eye disability, meaning their eyes do not work together. So reading is extremely difficult for them. Um, so giving them time to try to read the scriptures for themselves, these two students are, these two brothers, um, they just sit there um, with nothing to do because they can't, they have to listen to the scriptures and, um, you know, audibly get it. Now, the family is fantastic about uh, doing company at home. And so one, one trick I learned was to call on these boys to maybe summarize what the scripture block was about, because the Lord has blessed them with amazing memories to remember. But I, I'm wondering how to adapt this for the students in our situation. So Roxy, you cut out there towards the end, um, but I think I understand what you're asking. Oh, um, I, I I love your question. Um, I've got two answers. One is uh, to one of the first slides we read about seeking the Spirit for each individual. You know, as you consider, maybe Heavenly Father has an idea that we haven't thought of yet. One idea is that you could also play those 10 verses audibly, you know, through the app and ask students to follow along in their scriptures while we listen to this. So then it's both being read aloud and the students who can read can follow along and mark and underline, or potentially you just have one student who reads those 10 verses aloud and then everyone else is following along, looking for their question, could be a solution. But like I said, I'd imagine Heavenly Father has more creative ideas than I do. Well, thank you. So uh, our, our time is short here, and this is not intended to be a full encompassing training that helps you 
completely know everything to do on this regard, but it's just to kind of start to get the ball rolling a little bit as you continue to seek the spirit. Uh, I want to end with a couple of quotes here from our prophet. Okay. He said recently, many of God's most noble spirits, perhaps his finest team were sent to earth at this precise time, the most crucial time in the history of the world to help gather Israel. They are among the best the Lord has ever sent to this world. They have the capacity to be smarter and wiser and have more impact on the world than any previous generation. I just want to testify that's who's in your class. Um, they may not see it. In fact, I'm guessing they do not. Um, and their friends don't see it in each other. But the prophet does. And he's asking us to, when we believe this, we will do things differently in our class than has been done before. We won't just rely on talking and telling. We won't just rely on them, well, pat them on the back because they showed up. No, we're talking about people with an incredible capacity to have a huge impact on this world. And when we believe and recognize that we'll do things differently with them in, in our time. Um, thank you for, for accepting the calling to be a seminary teacher. This is not an easy calling. Uh, there's high expectations for you. Uh, there are people praying for you. There are parents who are just so desperate for something to click with their children this fall when they come to your class. And I know that the Lord will sustain you in your efforts. He is so good to, to seminary teachers. He's going to bless you in more ways than you can even imagine. And I share that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, we're going to close. I have time if anyone wants to stay on and, and ask.